Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 149, recorded December 16th, 2011. A positive view on hardware. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ford, featuring available voice activated sync with sync services, which enables you to customize your driving experience with personalized news, traffic, and directions. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to Netflix.com slash Twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by the man who is at home this week, Mr. Ryan Shroud of PCPer.com. How's it going, man? It's good. Uh, I, I plan on being home all through the holidays, actually, up until the hell that is CES. <laughs> Everybody loves CES, especially you. We should, should we leap right in today? I know it's Friday night when we're recording. This is very unusual. Yes. Your date night is being threatened. So, ladies and gentlemen, if the show seems <laughs> a little brisk, it's all about Ryan's love life. Video Perspective, wow. Antec 1100 case review. I got to say, this is a good looking case. If you're it, into the giant, shiny window on the side of the case. There is, there is a giant window um, in it. It's actually, it's kind of weird. If you look at the photos of it, we didn't have fans installed, but a lot of that would be blocked by uh, a couple of fans that could be installed. This is very, very, very similar case design to the Antec P280 we talked about a few weeks ago. It's actually built on the same kind of uh, base chassis with a, with a few kind of key differences. One is there's no door on the front anymore. Now you have this kind of mesh front grille. It does have uh, space for two 120 millimeter fans, and it has a fan filter. The, the thing I, the one thing I don't like about it. Somebody asked me why we got, gave this a uh, the silver award as opposed to the gold award, which which we liked uh, a lot on the P280. And it really comes down to to get to that fan filter on the front, you have to rip off the face, the front plastic bezel basically of uh, of the of the of the chassis. And I know you've probably done that many times yourself, Patrick. <laughs> and it's always kind of a scary feeling that when you take it off this time, this is the time that those uh, plastic clips will break. Will finally shatter. Yeah, and then, then you run into some issue maybe with uh, rattling or something like that. But, I mean, otherwise it's got, it's got lots of the same features, support for XLATX motherboards, lots of hard drive bays. Uh, it does have... A unique fan spot on the back door, like the back mm -hmm. um, panel, where there's actually a fan pointed directly at the back of the processor, like so on the back side of the motherboard. It's kind of weird, um, but I guess it kind of makes sense, right? There's this kind of like a hot spot on a motherboard is right where the the on the back of the CPU where the cooler mounts. So the same place where there's a big cutout opening for you to replace the cooler, there's also a 120 millimeter fan for you to. It's, it's got that big 200 millimeter fan up front. I love that you can turn the LED off, but does it actually have a filter on the giant fan up front? Well, uh, the one up top is, is an exhaust fan, so it does not. Are you talking about the, the top 200 millimeter? No, uh, the front, uh, I'm looking at the bottom picture on the, on the first page of the review where it says, rather than a spot for two more 120 millimeter fans up top, the 11, oh, Sorry, that is, a, I, that is a that is that is a skewed perspective of the case in that photo. We have turned it. <laughs> we have turned it slightly because our camera would not get tall enough to take a picture of the top uh, while sitting on the table. That's our fault. Oh, yeah. That's our bad. Uh, but it still has the side access. Any, anywhere where there's an intake filter, it does have. Or any place where there's an intake fan, there is a filter. So that's Good. nice. Very smart. Um, pretty cheap too. 120 bucks, and you get some of the benefits like the rub, rubber kind of. Uh, grommeted cable routing openings on the side of the motherboard and stuff. Uh, pretty nice. You know, Antec's done a good job with these last two cases, trying to get back into that kind of hardcore mainstream enthusiast type market with low-cost options that have some pretty nice features. I personally, between the two, the P280 and 1100, kind of prefer the P280. I'm more mm -hmm. of a fan of the noise dampening material that they use on the P280 that they don't use on this. 
This is more right. geared towards performance, has a lot more fan openings and options and that kind of stuff compared to the P280. Uh, but both are, both are pretty good. Nice. The uh, CPU you've been waiting to review for quite some time, the Intel Core i7-3930K Sandy Bridge E. Got a chance to get hands-on. And actually, I was impressed. You gave this the gigantic PC Perspective Gold Award. I'd say that's going to be a big thumbs up. <laughs> it is. It is. So Sandy Bridge E now is the kind of default highest performance enthusiast platform out there. The X79 chipset plus Sandy Bridge E giving you 40 lanes of PCI Express, uh, eight, or what is it, uh, you have six cores, 12 threads, up to 3.9 gigahertz, that kind of stuff. The problem with the first processor review, which was the 3960X, standing for Extreme, is that it was $1,000 and $990 MSRP. Uh, this right. processor, the 3930K, which we should point out, even though one is an X and one is a K, both are fully unlocked. Both will allow you to go up or down in multipliers, uh, memory bus speeds, voltages, all the, the overclocking between these two parts is the same. There's no real delineation there. But this is $550, so not quite 50%, but pretty close to half of the cost of the 3960. Now, the, the difference in clock speed, though, is only like 2.5%. <laughs> so you're getting Which about is, a 45% discount in price for a 2.5% decrease in clock speed and performance. Which is not even going to be noticeable in most benchmarks. Correct. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's definitely not going to be noticeable in real-world usage. And even in our benchmarks, if you look at some of the stuff that's typically pretty CPU-centric, like the media, media encoding tests, like a handbrake or a virtual dub, those types of things, the scores are, are, are very, very similar uh, between the two. And, you know, the, the, in the places where the, the Sandy Bridge E definitely outpaced Sandy Bridge, it continues to do that. In the places where they were close before, it's a little bit mm -hmm. closer now because, you know, you're losing that 2.5% clock speed. But you still get all the features of uh, the, the X79 platform, the 40 lanes of PCI Express, the motherboards that have the capability to support quad SLI and quad crossfire and those types of things. It's a, it's a really good... I, uh, compromise, I guess I'll say, between the, the price and the performance that you got on the 3960. <laughs> what, what I think might be even just as interesting, and hopefully, if everything goes well, we'll be able to talk about this next week, is mm -hmm. that the third Sandy Bridge E processor, that's not going to be actually for sale until probably January, February timeframe, the 3820, I think it's called. It's actually a quad core, not a six core part, but you get the benefits of the, the PCI Express lanes and the platform and that kind of stuff. And we're hopefully be able to test that one before next week if uh, nice. everything falls into line. So, and that's the one that's going to be probably even about half the price of the 3930 that we're talking about now. So it'll be 990, 550, 275 or something like that. <laughs> and I that gets into the realm of the, yeah, that gets into the realm of the Core i7-920 that I knew you are a big fan of and that tons of enthusiasts were fans of. And I'll be curious to see if the 3820, 3820 can kind of um, take that spot over. I'm not, not quite ready to upgrade, but it'll be nice to know that there will be a CPU worth upgrading <laughs> to this time. Yeah. We should talk AMD Catalyst, 11.12 uh, driver, um, OpenGL 4.2 support, uh, support for AMD HD 3D tech when using a 3x1, landscape Ifinity display group, improvements, um, basically enabling controlling dual graphics within the Vision Engine Control Center, RHEL 6.2 early look support, and all of that pretty much pales. You guys, PC says screw that, get the, if you're a gamer, screw that, get the AMD <laughs> Catalyst 12.1 preview. Just skip 11.2, go to 12.1. This is pretty interesting, and I'm going to let you explain what's going on there so I don't screw it up. <laughs> well, it was odd. They have basically released 11.12 and 12.1 on the same day, 12.1 preview. So right. they, they do one major driver release every month, and that's 11.1 for January, 11.2 for February, and then 12.1 for January. Well, they released 12.1 preview. I think it has something to do with their upcoming graphics cards that we'll talk about later in the show as well. Um, but... 12.1 has everything that 11.12 has in it, plus uh, it adds in interesting things like, uh, let's see, where was it at here? I think it adds in all the fixes from 11.11 .11 B and C, the Skyrim, the Battlefield 3 fixes, 
Um, it also adds HD 3D technology uh, for crossfire configurations and stereo 3D over HDMI 1.4a connections, 1080p at 30 hertz. They figured out how to kind of overdrive the HDMI 1.4a connection. Uh, it was previously limited to 24 hertz, and now they were able to get that up to 30 hertz. So you get a little bit better performance there. And both of these drivers, I think both of them, let me make sure, yes, they are the first to implement HD 3D, which is their version of 3D Vision, on iFinity displays. So we had NVIDIA surround and 3D Vision surround. Now you have iFinity and HD 3D iFinity. So a very limited group of people, a very small niche inside of a niche inside of a niche, but they are moving the technology forward, right? They, they're introducing it. I think they're calling it iFinity 2.0 type of thing with some added features. And these driver releases are part of that. Um, I don't, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird again to release two drivers in the same day. They sent us they sent us notifications of it in the exact same email as well. So, right. yeah. But if you uh, have AMD cards and you want the latest performance improvements, and especially if you do HDMI 1.4a, you know, 3D to your TV or something like that, this this is a a pretty big improvement with the 12.1 update too. <laughs> Yeah, not too bad. Speaking of uh, pretty big improvements, Apple's going to, the rumor, we should say, Digitimes uh, is the source on this one. They're they're basically, I uh, almost want to, they used to be kind of a trade publication to people in the consumer electronics industry or the, the PC industry, and now they've kind of become one of the great fodders of blogosphere mayhem. <laughs> but the the point that, that I'm so slowly getting to is is the kind of uh, increase in resolution uh, that, that Apple pulled off with the iPhone going to the retina display. They may be trying to pull off with the MacBook lineup. Quote, I'm going to quote from PCPer.com here. Allegedly, Digitimes has heard from sources in the upstream supply chain that the new MacBook displays will have as high as a 2880 by 1800 resolution. That's approximately 261.25 pixels per inch. To put that into context, a 1280 by 800 display, which you typically find on a 13-inch MacBook Pro, is 116 pixels per inch. That is a doubling of density uh, and a fantastic and possibly even ridiculous resolution for a 13-inch display. Um, on one hand, you'll be able to read like all your web pages, uh, or at least most of your web page, on a on on your screen without scrolling. On the flip side, most of us without superhuman vision or people that don't live inside of Photoshop editing are going to be uh, doing some interesting. It'll be interesting to see what they do to actually make text readable uh, at, at that level of of, of resolution. Um, now the flip side of that, of course, is that this is essentially a rumor that Digitize, uh, Digitimes is publishing. Um, based on uh, sources upstream. So, you know, sources upstream could be fundamentally accurate, like, I just sold an order for 100 million of these displays. Or it could be like <laughs> somebody being like, hey, Apple's asking us to quote a spec for this kind of display. Because I would be really interested to see where they were getting that kind of glass from, because that is a higher resolution than anything I've heard of anywhere in terms you of pixels I per inch on a display of that size. I have it on a fairly good authority that this is, in fact, going to happen. It's a totally different source uh, right. in that regard. But it's I, – I, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I'm not, I'm not sure I see the, the huge benefit. So, obviously, what they'll do is they'll just increase the, the relative text size and that kind of stuff. So, they'll make text smoother but not necessarily <laughs> smaller, right? I mean, obviously, right. if you're talking about a 13-inch or a 15-inch screen, if you did the same – resolution scaling that we have with that same DPI, that would be awful. Um, this, what this kind of does for me is it gives me hope that we are going to see these types of screens in larger form factors on desktops as well in the not too distant future, right? If you can get a 2880 by 1800 resolution screen um, on a 13 inch display, then hopefully we'll see that on a 27 inch display, you know, that, that Apple or some other vendors will be able to release as a desktop resolution, right? Because, I mean, that's, that would be awesome. That would, that would solve a lot of problems. Especially it would answer it a like lot of my complaints about 1080p. Oh. Yeah. What's I mean, that? I, especially if it was like $500 instead of $1,500. I mean, you can get like, right. you know, 2560 by 1660. Is that right? 2560 by 1600 displays right now, but yep. usually at a phenomenal cost compared to a 1080p monitor. Of a, I mean, at this point, it's so funny. If, if you're looking for a 27-inch monitor, 32-inch monitor, unless you're going to pony up for $1,000 uh, for the higher resolution models, it almost 
always pays to just basically buy an HDTV instead. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's yeah. it's it, it's my biggest and complaint about our desk. technology <laughs> right now is the somewhat stagnant display technology options we have. I don't really like. I like 3D. I think it's cool, but that's not where I think things should go. I, I really have a, it's a sore spot to me that 1080p has existed as long as it has, has become the standard that it has, and there's nothing really pushed beyond it. I do have, I did get some hands-on time with a 4K display recently, <laughs> which was, uh, for those who don't know, a resolution of 4096 by 2160 on a 36-inch screen, and that was pretty awesome. Uh, There's a lot of HD Nation fans who insisted that 3D was a complete waste of time and that Hollywood should immediately jump to 4K display. And Hollywood and, and, and the television studios should immediately jump to 4K content because that was the next logical step for resolution in, in home theaters. Um, to, to put it, to, it's it's funny, the, the 4K <laughs> display requires two dual-link DVI ports mm-hmm. input into it. That's That's the amount of bandwidth that we're... They were talking about with a connection like that. It was impressive to see, uh, but I think the current selling price is about twenty six thousand oh, dollars. It's come down. For, <laughs> it's come down. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, well, I would really like that. That would be really cool. Imagine being able to test some games at forty ninety six by twenty one sixty. Uh, but I need to get a grant from the federal government first before we. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But I, I think. It makes sense, you know, Apple pushing this stuff again. They, they're, hopefully they're going to do this because I think it will only kind of filter down into the, into the rest of the market. Somebody needs to do it first. Somebody needs to go beyond 1080p. You know, Asus has a 27-inch 1080p screen. It's nice, but when you start getting above 24 inches, the screen still, when you're, especially when you're sitting as close to it as you are with a computer monitor. Obviously, with TVs, it's a little bit different. I mean, but, you could uh, do 720, you know, as long as it's at the far end of the bar. But as soon as you're trying to put it three away from your face on the desktop, yep. 1080p basically just, it looks, it looks unpleasant when you're doing text. Yes. No it doesn't doubt. It's pleasant. Ford's cars. <laughs> exactly. I got to say, I got to, we've, uh, we, we've had a, uh, we, we've had a 2012 Ford Mustang, uh, uh, at Texilla for a couple weeks in candy apple red, and it's really a challenge for me to behave myself behind the wheel. But uh, we should take a moment. Why to do you think. have to behave yourself? It's not it's your no car, comments. right? <laughs> <laughs> it's still my driver's license, dude. It's my insurance payments is the problem. All right, that's fair. So uh, with that, we will let you know that this episode is brought to you by Ford, featuring available voice-activated sync with sync services, including uh, some new stuff like personalized news, traffic, and directions. Sync services enables you to personalize your driving experience. So whenever you get in your car, you always have access to the information that you want, not anybody else, no other drivers. Uh, You get personalized alerts for weather, sports, news, stocks, even horoscopes, if you're into that kind of thing. Um, I'm always interested in what Sagittarius has to tell me. Personalized traffic alerts on frequently traveled routes. That's kind of nice. Uh, if it knows you're frequently driving between Petaluma and Oakland, Patrick, it will it will know to alert you of all those uh, accidents on Take 101. The ferry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the updates are delivered to you via an available in-dash display or to read as you drive or sent to your mobile device via SMS. So there's lots of different options there depending on whatever hardware you have inside your car. And Sync users can personalize their accounts with the information that, with the information they want at the Ford website, Ford.com slash Sync. So you don't have to worry about kind of fooling with an in-screen display or doing something from your phone or anything like that. You get all you get the ability to set all that up on a computer where the interface is nice and easy to use, keyboard, mouse, all that kind of stuff, and then it's all ready for you when you get into the car. Uh, Ford Sync with Sync services, personalized traffic and information services are available on the 2012 Ford Focus. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. And uh, we thank them for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Woohoo! We have more news items to get to before we jump into some emails. 
Yeah, uh, OCC technology, Petrol, SATA, 6 gigabyte SSDs reduce SSD deployment costs by 30%. This is actually, look, everybody wants an SSD, or at least everybody that wants a faster machine or ridiculously fast boot up times. And yep. uh, uh, I guess earlier this week, I want to say uh, uh, Tuesday this week, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday this week, earlier this week, uh, OCC launched uh, an IndyLynx Everest-based uh, SSD series called Petrol, which would be the British word for gasoline. Yeah. Uh, quote, the Petrol series enables future adoption of SSDs and cost-sensitive applications while taking advantage of real-world performance and a complete set of the IndyLynx Everest platform or complete feature set. And I was kind of curious, did they actually figure out a way to drop the cost by 30% or, or are they just using, because they're using uh, uh, the Indy, the IndyLynx and, and memory prices have come down. I'm just kind of curious how they can deliver 128 gigs for 150, 256 gigs for 340. This is MSRP, by the way, not street. Yep. And then uh, a half a terabyte for $649, which on the other hand, I start thinking of some of the other prices out there and they, I hate to say it, they don't seem as, I'm thinking of street prices versus MSRP. So I'm looking right. at them as, their MSRP versus other people's street prices. But I want to see what the street prices of this new generation of hard drive is. I also want to know how reliable it is. I also want to know how they cut the price. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Alan tried to explain it to me a little bit last night. They're using different flash and a slightly cut down version of the controller. So you'll notice like the performance uh, is 400 megabytes per second read speed, which is really good. Um, but it's uh, limited to like 170 megabytes per second write speed, which is significantly lower. Also, the, um, the random write IOPS per second are fairly low as well. If you look at those, there's 7,700, I think, at the 128 gig model or the 128 gig, yeah, SSD. So those, those are lowered. And, and that is why you're getting this performance decrease. But Right. I think I think the pricing model is actually really aggressive. So we're talking about 128 gig drive for 150 bucks MSRP, like you're saying. And street prices will probably be a little bit lower than that when these finally come out. Um, and the fact that you can get a 64 gig model for 90 bucks just right out the door, uh, the, compared to this is basically the same as what was the SSD that was released? Um, that's based on the same controller. Yeah, you know, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, yeah, well, the, 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 the other series are released based on the same controller, but a little bit higher end controller and a little bit higher end flash. This is just basically them trying to lower the price. You know, they make it sound fancy when they say reduce SSD deployment costs. Obviously, with that kind of language, <laughs> they're referring to the business side of, uh, of the market. Right. But the idea is even when these show up in the consumer, consumer fields at Amazon and Newegg, they will be lower cost. And... That's all we want, right? That's that's what we want to see is these go down quickly, and they, and they're mm -hmm. that hasn't been quick, but it's been consistent, I guess, which is which is good. And again, since this is the right now, OCZ is the only pre, only company with access to this controller since they own that company. We right. get to see if this type of uh, option is available to anybody else. OCZ could have a real kind of ace up its sleeve if they can offer the lowest cost solution because their controller allows them to do that paired with specific flash memory modules so there you have it yep interesting uh, note from via they uh, dropped a press release this week um, that they're going to be supporting android on their x86 hardware along with uh, uh, well whatever they normally <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know it's true it's like normally you would run there's there's a number of operating systems including obviously linux uh, windows uh, and anything else that runs on traditional x86 processors but I thought it's really interesting that VIA sees an opportunity, uh, or uh, what's the line from, from the article? VIA believes that running Android and x86 embedded systems presents the opportunity for low-cost entertainment systems capable of playing pack 1080p video in vehicles, planes, and kiosks. And it's kind of funny because you look at embedded systems from VIA, they make a whole bunch of them, and, and there's all sorts of operating systems that are traditionally been run on those. But I think it's mm -hmm. interesting that they're looking at an x86 compatible platform that's got... Uh, what I'll call, for lack of a better set of, of language, uh, uh, bio support for Android. Um, and it's interesting, uh, uh, Android SDKs and then via has got what they call the Smart ETK or Embedded Toolkit um, that allows, quote, monitoring and control of peripheral roles. So it's interesting that they're saying, like, applications of this include controlling lights or environmental systems in your home via a touchscreen-enabled embedded home control center. 
Um, you know, they've got a video where Via is showing off Android running on their uh, EITX, EI, EITX 3002 platform. Uh, and then uh, using a touchscreen panel, connected to it to control an external light or fan. And I can't decide if this is something they kind of have a customer in mind for, or they're like, we did this really cool thing where it could play 1080p video and acts as your central home controller. Um, they they tend to do the latter. They tend to be, yeah. they tend to go yeah, with, here's yeah. this really cool thing we built. <laughs> right. Please, somebody find an application and buy a lot of them. Um, <laughs> but I mean, this is... The, so they the, we talk at the end of this news piece that Tim wrote up, I believe, uh, that you know, Android x86 is already out there, and it's kind of a, of a, a hack project to get Android on there. But Android announced that they were going to support x86 at IDF in September when they got up on stage with Intel and said, yeah, we're going to support Android. It's going to be one of our primary platforms for uh, Android going forward. So, you know, this this is kind of them saying, hey, we have hardware. It's already in place for this. Right. Via has traditionally been known as, you know, low-power low performance computing options, um, not necessarily small enough to get into the phone market, but definitely for, you know, the, the computers on airplanes and that type of thing that they're talking about, home automation, those things as well. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see. Yeah. I thought it was also interesting. You guys were in the lab, um, uh, during the setup. It's, it's, I've, I've, I've been in this situation myself because no matter how much money uh, Intel or NVIDIA might throw at Q&A testing, they're never going to, at this stage, they're never going to cover every variation of a GPU with every variation of a motherboard and BIOS and manufacturer. And, right. uh, and uh, you were trying to get uh, uh, SLI running on, uh, on an X79 motherboard. And I'm kind of curious, is it, is it only the EVGA GTX 560 Ti2 winner, all the GTX 560s? that you cannot run uh, in SLI on X79 motherboards? Um, much to my dismay, apparently it is only this particular card. <laughs> the very one that I had installed first to, basically we rebuilt, we completely, I completely rebuilt our GPU test bed for the, the pending uh, Radeon 7000 series launch. And uh, we decided to go with X79, Sandy Bridge E, you know, 16 gigs of memory, one of the best of the best, again, to make sure we put as much of the bottleneck on the GPU as possible. And I was like, okay, well, here's the set of cards I want to test for this upcoming review. Uh, this GTX 560 Ti2 wins sitting here. Let's just do that one first. And then I spent an hour and a half banging my head on the table trying to figure out why this card will not work, why SLI is not working. I you know, went through like six or seven different driver revisions. I went so far as to like see which driver revision I used on the initial review, go find that one in a previous release somewhere and install that one and still didn't get it to work and that is when i said okay this is not my fault i don't think um and it's kind of you know it's more of a psa in the news piece but then i, I kind of use it as a as a soapbox all, uh, opportunity to, to complain about nvidia's continued insistence that sli be a <laughs> licensed technology as opposed to just right. an open technology crossfire Will, will run on any board that has two PCI Express slots, two full-size PCI Express slots. If you, can, if you can plug in two video cards, it will almost always work. They don't charge anybody for it. They don't pretend that there's some kind of vetting program for it. NVIDIA, on the other hand, still wants to preserve their brand. They want to select which motherboards get SLI and that kind of stuff, even though they do blanket licenses to these, to these vendors like Gigabyte and MSI and ASUS. And... They charge a little bit of money, not a lot, but just a little bit, just enough to make sure that it's a licensing program. But because of that, you get into these things where the drivers have to recognize specific keys in the BIOS and the specific keys in the, in the graphics card in order for it all to be enabled. And what we ran into is, okay, here's a brand new platform, X79, and something doesn't match up. The, the driver in the, in the BIOS... And, and all the, the graphics card are not working together as they should, not because of any technical reason, but purely because of, ah, uh, we forgot to hit that switch in the driver. Damn, our bad. And it's a licensing thing. They don't wanted to make sure that you couldn't run SLI on everything. So it's, it, it, was, it was a pain in the ass, cost me a lot of time. And, and I'm sure that there are consumers out there that bought this card. I know there are. And how many of them are going to upgrade to X79 platforms? And how long do we have to wait for it to actually be enabled is the problem so please i'm hoping this. that it gets enabled by the weekend because i have a lot of crap to do on this platform <laughs> so and it's not but, playing skyrim it's benchmarking people 
Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you are correct. <laughs> oh man! Speaking of unfortunately and 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 driver recognition issues. So bulldozer. One of the issues with bulldozer is that, uh, or one of the issues with bulldozer performance, right? Since we've bagged a lot on bulldozer, and bulldozer actually does a lot of cool stuff. But essentially, Windows Seven, Windows Eight will detect all the bulldozers. Uh, uh, processing cores properly, although we could argue on the definition of a core and whether or not Bulldozer has as many cores as we think it does, which we probably don't want to get into right now. But uh, Microsoft released a patch. Uh, v VR Zone has a really good article on it. Uh, Microsoft released a patch titled, quote, an update to optimize the performance of AMD Bulldozer CPUs that are used by Windows 7 based or Windows Server 2008 R2 based computers is available. So, um, Bulldozer architecture, basically, if it's the turbo mode isn't working properly or detected properly, uh, it doesn't give you the performance. Microsoft said this patch was going to increase performance anywhere between 2 and 7%, which is, is not bad for a, for a, a kernel hot fix uh, being dropped onto an existing operating system. Uh, but the patch got pulled, uh, mostly because it was creating a lot of problems for a lot of people who downloaded it. Um, so here's the thing. There will be a full... There, there will be a properly engineered patch that should not cause as many traumatic problems for end users of the bulldozer uh, processor. However, um, you know, right now the patch is gone, and, and don't get too upset. It'll be back. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, pretty much. Is, you know. It was like I got news notice of it last night, and people were like, oh, Ryan, you're going you're gonna to test this now. I was like, yeah, I was like, I was like all right, I'll get the bulldozer system back out and do that. And then, oh, wait a minute. I don't see it listed <laughs> on uh, the downloads list anymore. Did a little research. Oh, well, it doesn't exist anymore. That's good. I didn't. Ha I had a lot of stuff to do tonight anyway. We'll move on <laughs> to something else later. I hate it when that happens. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, while we're talking AMD, let's talk about Radeon HD 7970. Specs have been leaked. Three and a half teraflops, three gigabytes of VRAM, which is a freaking mess. Yep. What what's generating texture maps that big? <laughs> that you need uh, multi multi display gaming is really is really what I think this that that comes down to. A three gigabyte buffer is even at a twenty five sixty by sixteen hundred screen. I think is going to be overkill. But yeah. when we start talking about three displays at ten eighty p, you're talking about fifty seven sixty by ten eighty resolutions. Um, AMD's cards support five display affinity configurations. You're talking about even more pixels. And, you know, as you add GPUs, you don't add the frame buffer to them. You only add the computational power. So the more you get on each GPU, the better. And I think that's where the benefit they're going with there with the um, three gigs of memory. Uh, I, I can't really comment a lot on what the performance numbers are, but, I mean, the leaks kind of spell everything out if they're if they're true 3.5 teraflops of performance uh, is really impressive if we think i think the gtx 580 has like 1.7 teraflops now that's just raw theoretical performance not actual real world gaming performance so i don't think that this card will be two times as fast as the gtx 580 but it presents interesting data points for sure uh What's it say? 2,048 ALUs, so essentially 2,048 shader processors. Uh, yeah. Is this a thousand dollar GPU? Uh, I don't think so. No, 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 no. I, I don't. I don't think this will be outside of our normal realm of GPU prices. That was one thing that I was looking at. It was like it just it's just not a like dual. A G it's not a dual GPU card or anything. It's just it's it's built on 28 nanometer, right? So it's the first 28 nanometer GPU. So they're able to get that dice base down and put some more stuff in there. Hmm. Uh, not, you know, and, and that's, that is what we rebuilt our test bed. So I'm trying to think when the thing, I don't know if it'll be next week or not, but things are still <laughs> kind of shifting around. But that is the card as, as the leaks that permutate across the interwebs indicate. <laughs> We're getting that's close the to the release. The next big monster coming down the pipeline. Twitch at yeah. twit.tv is the email address. We love your questions. Do us a favor and send them out to us, twitch at twit.tv, or you can reach us on the Twitter. Uh, we are terribly clever in our Twitter names, at Ryan Shrout and at Patrick Norton, and feel free to ask us a question about computer hardware at any time. Right now, though, before we get to your questions on this show, we should take a moment to thank our sponsor, Netflix. 
That's right. Netflix, a longtime sponsor of the show. We love them all very much. Netflix will stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, saving you time, money, and the hassle of driving anywhere to drop anything off or pick anything up. Uh, <laughs> there are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows. You can uh, watch them on your Mac or your PC, of course, iPad, uh, your iPhone. More and more Android phones are continuing to support streaming Netflix as well. Uh, if you have a gaming console like a 360, a PlayStation 3, uh, even the Nintendo Wii, you can watch those. Actually, I think I saw a commercial. The Nintendo 3DS now supports streaming Netflix. I was actually in uh, a Netflix commercial I saw on TV. So they are just about everywhere. And even if you don't have a, uh, a gaming console and you don't have a PC that you want to sit in front of uh, and watch movies, you can, you can get cheap, low-cost devices like the Apple TV or the Roku box that hook up to your TV through HDMI port, and those have access to Netflix streaming as well. Pretty nice stuff. Uh, you can watch... Uh, TV shows and instantly, and this is one of the cool parts, is you can begin watching a show on one device and finish it on another. Uh, watch, Start watching a movie at home on your TV, go to bed, wake up the next morning and finish it, or finish it the next day on the way to work, probably not when you're driving, maybe for the passenger, on a bus or something like that. Uh, or when you, if you're traveling and you're on your way to the hotel room, you can finish it when you get to the hotel room, those types of things. It's great to have this kind of anywhere in the world DVR system essentially um and um you can watch those movies as many times as you want so if you just need to watch the mighty ducks 10 times in a row you could probably do that or if you have kids that need to watch their cartoons 10 times in a row you can definitely do that as well whichever way you choose to access netflix you can watch as many movies and as tv shows as you want anytime and you can cancel at any time uh, i don't think you're going to have that problem once you actually try out and enjoy the service so Here's the offer for you. Try Netflix today for 30 days, absolutely free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use that URL when you sign up for the free trial, netflix.com slash twit. 30 days, completely free. Try out the service. We think you're going to love it. Uh, Netflix streaming service is, is the bomb. It is awesome. We use it all the time. We thank Netflix for their support of both Twit and Twitch. And we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. Hi. Love Netflix. <laughs> Not just because they're a sponsor. Oh, Netflix is Netflix is good. You get a lot of entertainment for a simple monthly yep. fee. Max got a question about monitor calibration. He says, Hey guys, love the show. It's my first time writing in. I've been looking at some monitor calibration tools and I'm having a hard time choosing which one to get. I've got about seventy, maybe a hundred bucks to spend, and I want the best picture possible as my monitor isn't looking very realistic. Thanks in advance, Max. Um. <laughs> very realistic i'm not sure what i i'm not i don't i assume that means the color uh is off maybe just a little bit um I'd say the color doesn't seem very accurate you could also yeah it's kind of funny like ryan's laughing but he's got a point like you know ntsc like television Blu-rays, you know, cable television shows, they're all produced to kind of an NTSC standard where they, where they say this should be this bright, that should be that bright, this should look like this, this should look like that. You, you, you set up your monitor to these specs, and as long as the person creating the content uh, was paying attention and calibrated everything, you get, you get the video experience they intended, dot, dot, dot. Computers are kind of a mess because are we talking about like my photos don't real, look realistic? Well, that could be because you took a picture of somebody with too much flash or too little flash or that you processed it in Photoshop. You know what I mean? Like there's like I, I get why Ryan's, you know, let me explain why Ryan's laughing because realistic is a really tough word to apply to monitor calibration. Um, yes. That said. <laughs> Do you have one that you use um, for like multi-monitor configurations and stuff? At some point, I kind of gave up on the idea that I was ever going to have an accurate-looking monitor because <laughs> I have a couple of different monitors with vastly different screens. So I, I generally try to, to, to keep sort of one giant palette on one monitor and do all my video on the other monitor. Um, you know, gotcha. uh, there's like the Spider ones are pretty good. Pantone, on some, for some reason, I, I, I think Pantone's kind of the gold standard, even if it isn't. I, I wish Robert Harum was here because he would have automatically whip off like pros and cons of like 400 different uh color calibration tools, but Pantone, the, which my, is essentially my, color yeah. standard, you know, the Huey Pro actually, I think is a really good yep. deal. 58 bucks on Amazon. That's um, what I use. And, I, and I've had, I've had my Huey Pro for like six years, like no lie. 
And I still, every time I set up multiple monitors, I do a configuration and boom. It, it, it just works. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, Can't beat the price. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you on that one. And, and Pantone, basically Pantone, if, if you've ever looked at a magazine or, or, or a print ad, Pantone's kind of the, the color standard um, to the point where it's like Pantone colors basically come in a book and you pick them and you input a mathematical value for that yeah. and then the printer generates ink that color and that's how they actually secure that. Um, Data Color Spider, a lot of people like those, but I'm going to roll mm -hmm. with Ryan on this one and say uh, get the Pantone Huey Pro. It's 59 you know, 58 bucks, you know, with free delivery if you've got Prime, and that's about as simple as it gets. Joseph. <laughs> NAS options. Brace yourself, people. <laughs> he says, uh, well, actually, he says, first off, Leo's show is inspirational for me by the mere fact that he has such a positive view on people's situation with technology. Never an attitude, only solutions. What a breath of fresh air in these times where conflict is the vehicle of choice for success. I consider it's, us to also be inspirational, Patrick, and also say, a thought, breath of fresh air. Uh, I was going to say what? We, 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 we're <laughs> not in love with people. We have a positive view of people's situation with technology. Just sometimes we think that, that positive view should involve throwing the hardware out the window. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes we're not so positive with the companies, but it happens. Um, uh, anyway, his question, he says he has thousands of family photos that need to be available uh, to all in our house of five. I am the lone techie among us. My wife and three daughters would per peruse this library if it were available, but would not bother if they had to attach an external drive to do so. A few years ago, I bought a single drive NAS enclosure. It was not quite ready for prime time. I also want our family's video available too. We're using a D-Link uh, 655 router. Works fine. The USB port on it is slow for this. Thumbnails take a long time to show up. They have uh, an iMac, three MacBooks, an iPad, and a PC laptop that would all need to access this NAS. Thinks two bays would be efficient, but then that's why he's asking for advice. He says he has, quote, Googled out. He has been using Google since before most people had heard of it. It was part of Dogpile. <laughs> I just wanted to get on with putting together a nice home network for the family. I had the same issue. Uh, my wife had been saving her photos from her digital camera basically only to her laptop. And I thought, okay, this is bad news. Something was going to happen to that. Um, and it's going to be tears and crying and screaming all over the place. Uh, right. Meanwhile, I had built a kind of hacked up NAS out of an old Linux box for work stuff. Right. It's basically just RAID 1 array and go about that way. So we kind of did that same thing. For a long time, we just used that RAID array. Uh, on a Linux device that you could then mount as a as a network drive in Windows, and uh, I'm pretty sure you could do that on Mac too, and access it that way. Now we're actually using a Drobo, um, again because we we kind of ran out of space on that and wanted I wanted something that was simple and plugged in. The problem with Drobos is is they're expensive, right? That's they're very easy to use, but they're they're kind of expensive, and they're also uh, like the Drobo FS not very fast in our testing either. I don't know. Do you have any kind of suggestions to throw out there for him? <laughs> given, the, given the fact that he, he's, he, he's got an iMac, three MacBooks, and an iPad, I almost yeah. want to say, like, you know, pick a, you know, I also want to say skip the NAS. Um, you know, back things up. Use the NAS for, for storage, backups. Make sure, by the way, you also back up your thousands of digital photos somewhere off-site, whether it's like every month you swap hard drives with a cousin with all these photos on them or, or, or using something like Carbonite or, or Crash Plan. Because um, if, if, if the box gets stolen out of your house, your photos are gone. If your photos are stored on the cloud, then, then they should still be there if something happens. Mm -hmm. um, if if the photos are the photos on the cloud are wiped out, it usually means like thermonuclear uh, warfare or, or something else where you know you lost Much your digital photos. Is, yeah, it's not going to be a, a, a real critical kind of. You know, it's not going to be first uh, in your mind. But part of me was also like, man, if you got an iMac three by backbooks and an iPad, like set up an iTunes server that everything's tied into and, and put the photos on there. But the other thought I had was. Anything that supports uh, UPnP actually should make everything fairly easy to find. And I was looking, like, I know FreeNAS 8.0.2 did not have the, uh, did not have, uh, here's what I'm looking for, the FreeNAS.org slash category slash version dash comparison. 
and UPnP is is FreeNAS seven, but it has not been enabled uh, on FreeNAS eight. Okay. So part of me would say like a you know a, a free NAS box has possibilities, uh, an unraid box might have possibilities if you're looking to save money, um, or you know just just build an inexpensive PC you know turn on file sharing there uh, and uh, share it through iTunes or something. But uh, I'd be curious what everybody else is using to share their photos inside the house. But for me, it's like I try to put everything on UPnP and tie it to an iTunes box and and, and think about it as little as possible. The backup side, I thought about a lot more than that, but. I'm also re-engineering that over the holiday break, so it should be interesting to see <laughs> what horrible things I've done to the photo collection uh, 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 between now and CES. Yeah, ours is really just a, 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 a network share. Then it, it, he, he mentioned specifically like the thumbnails load slowly. That is the case on our Drobo as well. It is our case on. It is that case in our office as well. Where we kind of share things. Um, the thumbnail images are kind of generated on the fly on each local machine, at least on a Windows machine. I don't know exactly how it's done on a Mac. Um, so that may not be indicative of exactly how slow it is, right? So make sure you have uh, gigabit networking where you're wired, uh, G or N where you're wireless. You're gonna, I mean, it, it's not going to be as fast as having it locally. It's definitely not going to be the case. But uh, there, there, are, there are a lot of, of good options out there. Um, how about... An interesting email here from a different Patrick about <laughs> thermal paste for a GPU. Oh, boy. Hey, Ryan and Patrick, first off, love the show. Keep it up. I've got a quick question for you guys, and I'm pretty sure I've never heard before on the show. Do GPU vendors put too much thermal paste on their chips, and what is the quality of said paste? Oh, dear. The reason I asked is because recently I was doing my usual dusting inside my computer and decided to take my Gigabyte GTX 480 out to inspect it. I took the plastic casing off around the heat sink and discovered there was way too much thermal paste between the chip and the heat sink. I then proceeded to take the card apart, completely remove the caked on paste, and reapply some Arctic silver that I had lying around. Is this a common problem? After all was said and done, my card's temperature dropped slightly at idle and by about 8 degrees Celsius under full load. Thanks for your time and keep up the fantastic work. Thank you, Patrick. Um, well, here's the thing, right? Um, most consumer electronics are assembled offshore. They are assembled very, very fast by people who are working like 12-hour days for $2 a day and, and not making a lot of money. And QC varies radically from vendor to vendor. Um, and the truth is, is, is they're a lot less concerned about, is, as long as there's not so much thermal paste, it completely isolates the processor from the heat sink. I don't think they particularly care, right? Because you basically just put a put some fairly expensive you know basically took some quality time to apply some fairly expensive thermal compound in between the, the CPU and the heat sink uh, and you dropped a whopping eight degrees Celsius under full load which on one hand that's great but on the other hand um, you know I've, I've I've done the same thing with a CPU and dropped like 25 to 50 degrees Celsius under full load probably 25 degrees 50 is, is probably pushing it but you know, um, generally speaking, um, depending on the vendor and depending on the QC, the vendor pays for essentially from the from the people manufacturing their cards. Uh, on one hand, I don't I don't think they want to waste thermal paste because that's an expense. But on the other hand, I don't think they're probably most of them are not paying too much attention as long as it's not causing <laughs> return issues in the stores uh, where the cards are being bought. <laughs> yes, uh, which which uh, you know. Um, as long as as long as you're not having overheating issues, I mean, it's fun. Look, you're you're a geek. You're hacking your system. You're checking things out. You see an opportunity for improvement. I completely understand. You know, I'm, I was playing around. My son and I were playing with stomp rockets, which are basically like you know little tubes that you launch by stomping on an air bladder. And I, you know, I'm looking at that thing and I'm thinking like, gosh, you know, this isn't properly sealed. That I can make this open. And I bet we can get the rockets to go farther if you know if I apply. You know, if I glue this to this and I, I wrap, you know, electrical tape around that and I get a decent air seal, we're going to lose less air out of this joint. And, you know, it's part of being a nerd is like looking at something and being like, I just don't like the cable, the way the cables are arranged. Or, my goodness, that's a ridiculous amount of thermal compounds slopping out underneath there. So, um, you know, uh, the, the paste is the cheapest paste they can get away with without breaking the thermals as specified by the chip vendor. Uh, and do they put too much thermal paste on them? Sometimes, and I'm sure sometimes they don't put enough, but, uh, you know, as long as the card doesn't break and create a warranty issue, I don't think they're particularly concerned. Is that too cynical of me, Ryan? No, no. 
<laughs> um, we have an email from Chris uh, asking about quiet keyboards. And he actually specifies quiet mice, but, um, you know. Uh, he says, hey, guys, love the show. It's a great weekly view of all the happenings in the tech world. Tell Leo means to give you guys raises. Ooh. Right. Actually, tell Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I do some presentations for my PC, and what I've been finding is that my microphone is picking up the sound of me typing on my keyboard and clicking on my mouse enough that it's actually pretty audible in presentations. I'm using a Microsoft Ergonomic 4000 and a Logitech MX518 mouse. While they're perfect for regular use, do you have any thoughts on mice keyboards that would do away with all the typing and mouse clicks in the presentation? I assume you guys are typing and mouse clicking away throughout the podcast, but I never hear anything. What are you guys using? So uh, hmm. part of that magic is the microphone, not yeah. necessarily the keyboard. So uh, Patrick and I are actually both using Heil PR40 microphones, which do a very, very, very good job of blocking out sound behind them. So I can type away on my keyboard as I'm doing right now, and you can't hear it. Um, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I don't really... <sighs> I only know about keyboards that are loud, I have to be honest. Right. All of the, the cherry switches and mechanicals and all that kind of stuff, they are particularly loud. Um, it's, it's funny. My, my first thought is, is you know, if, if you're doing a presentation and it, your microphone is picking up mouse clicks, are you using the microphone inside of a notebook? And, and if yeah. you are, the first response is get a headset, uh, get a lapel mic, uh, get a microphone on a stand like we're using, something that isolates. You know, if, if the keyboard and mouse are, are making noise that you can hear, first of all, get the microphone out of the computer. You know, if you already have the mic out of the computer, get a better mic and get a more directional mic. Um, I would also point out that some people, a really good friend of mine who's like 6'2 and 130 pounds soaking wet, um, is a keyboard masher. He types louder than any other <laughs> game on the planet. So if you put him on a, on a, on a cheap-ass... Um, membrane, button membrane, inexpensive, low-cost keyboard that, that has no tactile response whatsoever but does sort of, you know, give you the letters you want when you press the keys. He will make that sound like me on a freaking 20-year-old IBM Alp switch keyboard of doom where it's like, you know, the keyboard weighs eight pounds because there's so much metal in it, which goes back to the sort of, you know, uh, Ryan's like, I know about loud, heavy keyboards. I don't know about quiet keyboards. So basically, the cheaper the keyboard and the more difficult it is to type on, the less expensive it will be. And the, or the cheaper the keyboard and the harder it is to type on, the less loud it will be. Um, but for us, the, the reason we sound so good is, is the microphones we're using and getting a microphone, getting a lapel mic, or getting a headset mic, something that gets the microphone, makes it very directional, puts it close to your mouth, and as far away from the keyboard and mouse as possible is going to do the most, uh, is going to make the biggest steps towards quieting it, down your keyboard. The only bit of information I was able to find on a quick search for specifically keyboards is apparently Logitech has a technology they call uh, Perfect Stroke, which enables whisper quiet typing. And that is available on three of their keyboards, uh, De Novo Edge, the Illuminated Keyboard, and the Wireless Illuminated Keyboard. Um, so there you go. The, actually, the De Novo Edge is the same uh, one I use uh, at, we did use it at one point at home in front of the TV because it has a little circular touchpad there for a mouse, which would also be silent. So you can check that out if you want. So there are apparently three of them marketed by Logitech as being whisper quiet. Whisper quiet. Not like that vacuum cleaner you bought. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It's whisper quiet. Comfortable, fluid, and whisper quiet. That's what it says. So there you have it. All right, we just got uh, a couple more <laughs> notes to get Go through there. here. You want to take a question from Rick? Rick's got a, well, Rick's, well, Rick says in episode 148, you were discussing some guy that wanted to back up something like two terabytes of data and that his upload bandwidth was only 100K. You suggested he take his computer to a friend and back up there, but there was a comment about problems with copying large amounts of data. I'm a longtime VMware user and frequently have to copy 100 plus gig VMs, virtual machines. I'm also frequently called to back up a crash, usually meaning hopelessly infected systems data files. What I usually do is boot a Linux distro and copy the files that way. Using a boot CD, even a WinPE CD, make sure that the copy doesn't terminate 99% of the way through because the file is locked or something. 
one of the it's actually that's really good so i can get my puppy linux mm -hmm. on boot it on the system and, and copy that data to an external drive one other thing rick says that i'm not sure you've covered in the past is a cool external usb enclosure i bought because i thought i needed versus wanted an eSATA enclosure I found the Zalman ZMVE200B on Newegg. It's out of stock now. And that also happens to emulate a USB CD ROM. You drop ISO images into the ISO dash ISO folder, and then you can boot them or just mount them. The drive is even more impressive since I am frequently having to disinfect computers and don't want their crud infecting my USB drive. <laughs> You can make the optical drive drive only, optical and HDD, or just HDD. If in any mode that allows HDD access, you can also flip up the physical write lock switch to prevent writing to the hard disk drive. This thing is truly awesome. Hey, it sounds truly awesome. Love the shows. It does. I'm going to replace my prehistoric AMD Athlon X2 4400, although my ThinkPad 520i5 with 16 gigs of RAM works well for me, and my library of virtual machines. Rick, that is an awesome heads up. Thank you so much for that. Now, I'd be curious whether or not Zalman or, or another company has a similar uh, drive out. Because I've seen some that offer sort of ISO emulation or, or USB CD-ROM emulation. Ooh, hey. Check this out. Online stores. Oh, it's on Amazon. Is it sold out? Yeah, check for us. <laughs> That's a pretty Available sweet device. Oh, hey. Well, no, I see one used from 4588. <laughs> I hope it's not All a right. discontinued we'll, item. That would be a bummer. We will search more for this, Rick. Thank you for the we'll heads do. up, sir. Uh, um, so, our let. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, when Robert Hare was on, we had a question about uh, an electrician wanted to know if he could splice a second power supply unit into a first power supply unit. And what we discovered at the very tail end of this long conversation about why it was probably possible and maybe even safe, uh, why we wouldn't entirely want to do it, it turns out there's an entire subgenre of products that had recently been reviewed on hard OCP <laughs> that allow you to basically jumper a second power supply unit on your existing power supply units. <laughs> oh, really? So, <laughs> um, so it's kind of funny. Uh, uh, we, you can take over at this point. <laughs> Well, we, we got a couple of emails in pointing out specific items. This one from Thermal Take, which is, it's not, it's a secondary power supply that is kind of marketed as being specifically for graphics cards. It's a 650 watt power supply. It's, it mounts in two five and a quarter inch drive bays. Um, nice. It comes with two six pin and two eight pin PCI Express connectors. So this can power two graphics cards on its own. Um, and it comes with the connections necessary to make sure that it turns on at the same time as your primary power supply, which is really, really cool. It gives you some LED indicators in the front um, and that kind of thing, which is all for as a device at Frozen CPU. It's a Lian Lee accessory, which is pretty simple. It's basically so you can mount your own secondary power supply anywhere you want in the case. And then it has a split off ATX connector so that you can connect both of them to the motherboard so that when you hit the power button on the motherboard, it turns on both power supplies. When you shut down the machine, it turns off both power supplies. And that is like fourteen ninety nine at frozen so, CPU. So yeah, that's, that that's pretty good. Sort of manually figure out the jumpers or, or throw a, a switch and a, a paper clip in your, uh, in your secondary I have done that before. I, I had a power supply that I would use to power two external um, Coolance water cooling kits when we were using those on the test beds. And I had a little, basically a, a um, paper clip that you shorted out two pins on the ATX primary thing and it would turn on and you pull out and it would turn off type of thing. Not the safest probably. Um, and Ooh. then we have a, an answer from Chris who says, hey guys, all you need uh, for easy running of two power supplies is the power supplies and a five volt relay. On the second power supply, cut the green wire on the ATX connector and one of the ground wires next to it. Connect the green and black wires to the switched side of the relay. On power supply one, connect the powered side of the relay to one of the unused hard driver floppy five volt and ground wire from the first PSU. Then when the first PSU is turned on, it switches the relay on and we'll start the second power supply. Uh, he used that method when putting together a spare parts rig and only had some old 300 watt power supplies laying around. So it makes me envision that he had like four 300 watt power supplies sitting around and he kind of merged them all into one mega unit <laughs> sitting next to his case. Um, you can do that if you're the DIY type. I would go the frozen CPU route that is like 15 bucks. You know, yeah, and you get all the yeah, it's kind of hard there. Yeah. Hey, sometimes but hey, good news. You, just, you don't want to wait 
for that overnight delivery. Oh, man. If you happen to have hey, that 5-volt relay. What's coming up on PC Par? Somehow I feel you guys aren't going to be slowing down despite the fact that we are barreling towards Christmas at a high rate of speed. No. Um, apparently everybody uses the time between mid-December and CES to put as much crap out as possible. Um, one of the cool things that we're, I'm almost finished testing, I was trying to get the review written up today, but I haven't finished up, is this video card that looks like any normal video card. This is a Galaxy GTX 570 MDT card which stands for multi-display technology. This is an NVIDIA card that will support four displays out of it at one time, and it will actually do three-way three uh, NVIDIA surround, essentially, technology, but with a single video card, which you can't really do on any other um, single GPU graphics card from NVIDIA. So we were able to run games 5760 by 1080, and the GTX 570 has a decent enough amount of power. We were able to run... You know, even like Battlefield 3 on high settings at that resolution, we got pretty playable frame rates. So we'll have a, a review and lookup of that next week. And, of course, more video cards. And hopefully that uh, Core i7-3820 by next week as well. Cool. Yeah, and uh, what, do you got, what do you guys got hot got to plan for the holiday editions of Tech we got uh, our last-minute shopping guide for geeks. Should an extra geek show up at your house on Christmas Eve? Um, talking about our, our, our sort of Christmas lists and uh, we'll be uh, doing some uh, PC, basically a whole episode that's about PC uh, repair and upgrade. We were originally going to build a PC and then we decided it would be more fun to sort of do everybody's personal upgrade for their system. So Sweet. I think if I find one this weekend, I'll be doing a GPU upgrade. But uh, nice. we're talking about like sort of diagnosing the power supply issues on, on Serafina's machine. Veronica's doing a major update to her gaming PC. And uh, hopefully, uh, Veronica talked Roger into a major upgrade to the CPU and motherboard in his incredibly aged gaming box. So that, that, that'll be fantastic. Awesome. We need to get you out of here because you have a wife waiting for date nights. So that's it for this episode of Twitch. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. <laughs>